Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Paul Boyle, and you're very welcome here to the uh, 2.1 SME Development and Transition Workshop um, today. There is no plans for a fire alarm uh, today. If the fire alarm does go, we have to congregate in the car park just outside or over in the Tesco car park. The toilets and facilities are just out on your right-hand side. Um, if you are asking questions today, could I ask that you speak into the microphone so that others could hear it on the recording? Today's event will be recorded. Um, and there'll be opportunities afterwards to ask questions um, of the panel and SEUPB. So as I say, you're very welcome. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you a, a bit more detail about the concept note process and a bit of an overview. And then I'm going to hand over to my colleague in Ireland, David O'Neill, um, to give an overview of his policy interests from Ireland and uh, take you through some of the details. And then David has to, to, to nip on. Uh, uh, you may be able to ask questions of him at a later date. And then I'm going to hand over to Trevor um, Connolly from the Department for the Economy, who is the Director of Business Engagement, who's going to give you the Northern Ireland perspective. And then I'm going to hand over to Fiona, um, who's then going to take us through the concept note process and then I'll open it up for questions uh, once I've outlined a few of the significant changes from the programme. So as I say, you're all very welcome. How have we arrived here? Uh, I'm just going to talk you through that uh, and uh, where we are at today. So uh, the Peace Plus programme is a partnership with the Northern Ireland Executive, the Government of Ireland, the UK Government and the European Union. We're building upon the previous success of the Peace and Interreg programmes and looking around the room there's a few veterans of those programmes here with us today. Uh, we also have a renewed focus on peace and reconciliation and peace and prosperity. Uh, we're looking to ensure that all of our projects where possible are cross-border uh, and delivering economic and territorial development and we'll talk a bit more about that. So um, how did we get to the Peace Plus program? There was a significant level of stakeholder engagement. We held um, over, I think, 30 odd uh, public events with over uh, 10,000 people engaged and over 1,000 survey responses. Uh, and we also held a public consultation. We've also been working with the governments in Ireland and Northern Ireland throughout the process to ensure policy alignment, which has arrived at a Peace Plus program with a territorial cooperation area of all of Northern Ireland and the border region of Ireland and a fund value of 1.14 billion with six themes and 22 investment areas. You can have participants from outside the programme area. I'm conscious that there's, there's a lot of legacy issues from Scotland and they can engage in the programme providing they could demonstrate benefit to the eligible region. So, uh, this simple slide shows where we want to be. We want to be bang slap in the middle of building peace and prosperity. This particular workshop will focus on the programme area SME development and transition and we'll get into the detail of that once we've had the policy overview from the departments. So in terms of the project or programme life cycle, we're up here where the project uh, is at the development phase. We're looking to receive concept notes from you on the concepts that you think you could bring forward under 2.1. Uh, just to be clear, we don't have a formal programme monitoring committee established yet. There's a finance agreement that's going through Parliament in the coming weeks. And once that's agreed, the financial flows of the 1.1 billion will follow. Once we've agreed a PMC who could agree the various documentation, you know, the program rules and manuals and call documents, everything will be released at that point, along with a, an indicative timetable of when the calls are likely to open and close. But I'll, I'll talk more about that uh, uh, later on when it comes to the question and answer session. So we're just at the top of this life cycle here uh, in terms of where we stand today in developing a concept note. And I'm now... Uh, going to hand over to my colleague, David, um, who will give you an overview of the policy interests from, from Ireland. Uh, it's David O'Neill from the Department for Enterprise, Trade and Employment. Uh, 
Thanks, Paul, and uh, thanks everyone for, for joining me today. Uh, as noted, my name is David O'Neill. I'm the head of the Ireland UK unit in the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment. Uh, I'm going to be giving you a, a, a high level overview of the policy interest in my department and uh, generally and then specifically in relation to SME growth and transition. Uh, I'm conscious that a lot of you may have been here this morning uh, and may know some similarities in my presentation, but I do assure you it is a different presentation and you'll see that by the end. Um, so just to start by uh, pointing out the uh, areas of responsibility within my department. Um, we, you know, we have a number of them, and as you can see, they're very cross-cutting uh, and interlinked. The key one, probably in relation to this investment area, would be the support for SMEs. However, really, they, they are very cross-cutting, they are very interlinked. There are a number of areas that, that, that touch on each other, and you know, we would expect that this investment area will likely touch on a number of these areas. Um, our ministers, again, pointing out that sort of cross-cutting and interconnected element. Uh, we have uh, the Principal Minister, Simon Covey, Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment, the Minister of State for Employment Affairs and Retail Business, uh, Neil Richmond, and the Minister of State for Trade Promotion, Digital and Company Regulation, Derek O'Leary. Uh, our mission statement uh, is to lead on the creation and maintenance of high quality and sustainable full employment across all regions of the country by championing enterprise across government, by supporting a competitive business base to incentivise work, enterprise, trade and investment and by promoting fair and competitive markets. The vision is to make Ireland the best place to succeed in business across all regions of our country with vibrant enterprises, more high quality employment, growing trade, fair workplaces and higher productivity. Um, our recently published draft statement of strategy sets out our six strategic goals at 2025. Um, again, I, I won't go into too much detail on this, particularly for the people who, uh, who are here this morning, but you will see that connectivity and interactivity. In, in goal five, you'll know specifically the, the, the element of uh, growing further the all-island economy, and whereas that's in goal five, again, it, it, it flows throughout the, 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 the entire uh, goals of, of our department. Um, so there are a couple of key strategies and initiatives that inform the work of DETI. Uh, the first uh, would probably be Project Ireland 2040. So um, Ireland 2040 is the government's long-term overarching stra uh, strategy to and to build a more resilient and sustainable future. Uh, the availability of com uh, competitive world-class infrastructure uh, critical to support enterprise development and economic growth, particularly in the, in the regions. So to align our infrastructure investment with enterprise needs, we're working with our agencies to map the priorities for enterprise. And in relation to the border region specifically, um, we want to facilitate enterprise growth by supporting employment opportunities and improving accessibility to the region. Uh, so we're also engaging with government departments uh, and regulators to influence policy and regulatory reform in areas like planning, environmental licensing, uh, to support efficient infrastructure delivery and enterprise development. Um, so the other document that is really going to be informing the future direction of our department is the recently published Enterprise White Paper. So uh, the white paper on enterprise uh, was published in December 2022 and it sets out Ireland's industrial policy in the medium to long term. Uh, the vision is for uh, Irish-based enterprise to succeed through competitive advantage founded on sustainability, innovation and productivity and delivering rewarding jobs and livelihoods. Um, again, you know, there are seven priority area, areas and objectives here. Um, and in truth, you know, if, if you look at the investment area today, there's any number of these priorities that, that, that it could become aligned to. So very much encourage you all to, to, to look at that document. Um, the Enterprise White Paper recognises the importance of having the right framework conditions in place to facilitate enterprise competitiveness. Uh, an implementation plan is being prepared that I'm uh, told will be completed in Q1 2023. As I said this morning, I, I'm, I'm aware that uh, Q1 is ending next week, uh, but I'm assured that that's the, the most accurate timeline my, my, my colleagues have to hand. Um, so again, I, I encourage everyone to read the Enterprise White Paper and the implementation plans when they're published, which will, which will flesh it out in, in a bit more detail. Um, so just to sort of explain why I'm here, uh, as noted, I'm head of the Ireland-UK unit. Uh, we have two core responsibilities within the department. That's North-South coordination and Brexit uh, coordination. Uh, under the North-South coordination area, we are responsible for Delhi's role as accountable department for Interreg VA and Peace Plus, and there are two themes under Peace Plus that we are specifically responsible for. These are Investment Area 2.1 on SME development and transition, and uh, which is why everyone is here today, and Investment Area 2.2 on the Innovation Challenge Fund. Um, so 
if this, this is where we'll finally start to diverge a little bit from this morning. Um, I'd like to give you a, a, a sense of the work uh, of DETI in relation to sort of, uh, SME growth and transition. Um, so the 2020 programme for government committed to the delivery of a national uh, SME, SME growth plan. Uh, uh, so a task force was developed uh, and set up to um, focus on the areas of entrepreneurship, productivity, digitalization, competitive, competitiveness, internationalization, and clustering and networks. Uh, what followed was a report that was published in January 2021 that provided commentary on a broad range of measures. Uh, following from this, an implementation group was established to examine the recommendations and determine where it was considered significant progress could be made. And we have the list here of all the areas, uh, which again, you'll, you, you'll see a lot of sort of connectivity between that and, and, and the theme today. Um, so 2021, 2022, significant engagement took place across the department and wider government agencies towards advancement of these priorities. Um, in December 2022, a memo was brought to government to report on the progress that included the extension of the LEO mandate to work with companies with the potential to export who have grown to more than 10 employees. Uh, uh, the, the rollout of the SME test, which encourages um, regulators to consider the impact on SMEs for new regulations. Uh, the launch of the new Skills for Better Business tool, um, an improved portal for business information and assistance, which has recently gone live. And if anyone, anyone's interested, it's uh, www.supportingsmes.gov.ie. Um, we have a, a development of a, a new clustering framework and a range of new instruments launched in 2022 to improve access to finance and digitalization. So the work of the task force in 2023 is, is really going to be building upon the white paper on enterprise. Um, the, the, the previously identified priorities remain relevant uh, and uh, should be considered as, a, a additional, uh, as an additional priority measure for future progress. So once more, I very much encourage you to, 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 to read the enterprise white paper and the implementation plan to see the, the future vision and roadmap for my department when it comes to, uh, when it comes to SME supports. Um, so uh, that's it for me for today. Uh, as noted, unfortunately, I have to head off early, but if you do have any questions, uh, do feel free to share them with Paul and uh, I'll follow up accordingly if you, uh, once they get to me. So thank you all very much for, for today. Okay, uh, I just invite Trevor up to uh, give us uh, an overview of the policy and policy interest from Northern Ireland. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and apologies. I have a bit of a cold here, so um, uh, if I disappear into a climax of coughing, I do apologise. Um, Trevor Connolly, I'm Director for Business Engagement, Department for Economy, and I suppose today. I want to talk about two main things, 10X, our economic vision and what does that mean, and also the draft entrepreneurship strategy that we're working on uh, right now. So, um, there's three headlines in terms of 10X, more innovation, more inclusion, more sustainability. Okay, but what does that mean? And the next slide will give you a bit more detail, but I suppose one place that I try and point everybody to is if you go onto our website, and look up 10X, there's a document that says next steps for implementation that was published at the end of October. And that sets out a lot of the detail, the tier two metrics, and I'll show you some of these next, but it sets out what exactly we mean by each of these terms and what we're trying to do. But there's three elements here I want to concentrate on. Number one, the triple bottom line. So for us, when we're looking at investment, when we're looking at things going forward, we're saying you need to deliver all three. Innovation, we'll come to the next slide. Everybody digest that, that's pretty easy. Inclusion is going to be a lot more difficult. And sustainability, we've got a Climate Control Act. We're legally enforced to do this. But that means that people will have to change how they think, especially in terms of the inclusion. So one of the things we're saying is you must deliver all three. One is not sufficient. In terms of focus, what we've tried to do is identify where do we have world-class competitive advantage. You'll see that when we come on to the technologies and sectors. Because we're a small advanced economy, we can't be all things to all people. We need to focus on what is it that we're good at and how do we support those. And the last thing is scale. If we're going to transform the economy, we need to do things that are going to change the scale of the economy. So having a project that involves 10 people, that's great. We're looking at thousands. We're looking at something that's going to transform millions of turnover and billions. And how do we grow 
businesses that are going to change this, because that is the only way we're going to change and deliver more innovation, more inclusivity, and more sustainability. Now, apologies, it's a, it's a busy slide, but the bit at the top talks about the four or five things in terms of the innovation. So what do we mean? Increase the amount of spend by 55%, increase the number of businesses doing R&D, increase the number of innovation active firms, businesses who are doing innovation, and increase the number of students going through with STEM. So you're getting the pipeline and you're getting the spend in terms of inputs, but, but inputs is only so good. We also need to see about the dissemination of R&D across the economy. Because it's fine to do all of this fantastic research in the universities, but if our industries and our, our sectors aren't aware of that, we're not getting end-to-end -end benefit here. Inclusion, and this I think is where people, innovation, we've been trying to improve productivity and be more innovative for years and years. The inclusion bit I think is quite different because that's the bit where we're actually saying, well, what does that mean? And I've, I've, put, I've underlined the middle bit because I think that's the bit that actually makes the most difference. What we're talking about is closing the employment gap between male and female, between people with disabilities, people from the most socially deprived areas. Now, when I took, I'm looking out in terms of colleagues from Intertrade, Invest, etc., that hasn't been part and parcel of anything we've done in grant conditionality before. And that's, that's the department talking. So this is new, and we're going to have to work through this. But if we don't try and change this, it won't happen. We won't close these gaps. And thirdly, sustainability. You've got the 80% elect, uh, uh, sorry, consumption in terms of electricity from renewable sources. Greenhouse gases need to be 40% lower than baseline. We've got a target for 2030, we've got a target for 2050. And then double the size of Northern Ireland's low carbon renewable en energy. Now you've heard about things in terms of the hydrogen buses. There's also a, a huge amount of research being done in all of this. And this is new across the world. Everybody's trying to understand how you do this in terms of sustainability. So there's lots of opportunities there. And I have to say, and this is, there's a hell of a lot of things in Northern Ireland. We are absolutely world class in. We are at the cutting edge. But what we have to do is identify those, support those, and develop them. So, in 10X, it talks about, the actual document talks about technologies and, and, and sectors, and that refers back to the bit about fear of focus. We have to be aware of what we're good at and how do we support it. So in terms of technologies, we've identified cyber, software, robotics, artificial intelligence, the zero carbon, digitization, food supply chain, virtual production. Now, those aren't exclusive. What we're trying to do is do some research in terms of like, okay, so where are we? in terms of world-class competitive advantage? Is that the industry? Is that our supply of graduates? Is that our research? Where? Because we need to understand why other people think we're really good at it to be able to support and develop it. And then the sectors. So we have sectors, life and health, advanced manufacturing, agri-tech, low carbon, screen. Those are the sectors that we're saying can utilize a lot of these technologies and drive that forward but it's not exclusive to those sectors. What we're trying to do in the technology is develop that and then disseminate it across the whole of the economy. So back to that point, but there's no point having world-class research tied up in one of the two universities if the, the industry down the road doesn't know anything about it and doesn't have that interconnection. Okay, so a draft entrepreneurship strategy for Northern Ireland. Well, what does that mean? And I suppose this is a starting point. We've been working on this for about six, nine months. There's a lot of work still to be done, but I suppose we'll have some sort of key emerging themes. Support for SMEs. I'll come to that. And I'm sorry, next slide will give you a bit more detail. Next one, more and better innovation-driven enterprises. And this connects back to what Keith was talking about earlier this morning. So he was talking to you about 10X and his innovation work stream. And he was talking about the, that top bit there, about the R&D, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that we're trying to do is say, OK, SMEs are the lifeblood of any industry and any economy. It's 80% of this, this economy here in Northern Ireland. So of course, we have to support SMEs. But within SMEs are those people who have those bright ideas that disrupt and innovate. 
that are the Ubers and the Googles and the Microsofts and whatever, that all started off with somebody somewhere having a bright idea and getting support. And that's what we mean by innovation-driven enterprises. So something that we bit different, that's looking at an innovative way to actually solve a problem. Enhance our entrepreneurship with cultural ambition, I'll explain a wee bit more about that. Access to finance and develop home market leverage support. But I suppose to me, in some respects, the bit at the bottom is as equally important as all of the other bullet points. So by doing all of this, what we're also saying is we're going to have to focus support on diverse founders. So female entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs with a disability, entrepreneurs who are non-graduates, entrepreneurs who are coming from socially deprived backgrounds. We will have to positively intervene and help support those people because those are people who are not part of the mainstream as we speak at the moment. So we need to make sure that when we're developing all of this, we're actually actively going and trying to support those people to bring them to the market and help them develop their ideas and their thoughts. In terms of, sorry, I was, <laughs> my slide is a lot bigger, so I apologize. Um, SMEs, okay, so post um, the review of public administration, and there's council uh, colleagues here, council responsible for local economic development, social enterprise, and supporting female entrepreneurs. And we have been doing a lot of work in terms of the councils who have done an excellent work in terms of developing their enterprise support service, and that's being funded by the Shared Prosperity Fund. And hopefully that'll be launched sometime in the autumn this year. And that's, that's the councils, that's not DFE, that's work that they've been doing, but we've been working with them to, to, to develop that. So, and I listed out because I was very conscious that when people sort of think in terms of, well, who supports? Like, there's a long list there. You have Catalyst, you have CAFRI, Enterprise NI, the FE Colleges, Invest NI, Intertrade. There's an awful lot of people who provide really good, well thought through, well developed support for SMEs across Northern Ireland. And one of the things that we're looking at is actually, how do you actually try and bring all this together? That's probably one of the biggest challenges we have, is the base signing bit. Because everybody does a wee bit of everything. But is that duplicated? Can we actually bring together? Because immediately, as soon as I come into the room, everybody goes, oh, here's a guy with a checkbook. So you're going to have all the money and you're going to give us the, all this money to do stuff? No. I'd ha I actually have no money for this entrepreneurship strategy, but generally, I don't think we need it. I think what we need to do is prioritize what we have, identify where we have best practice, and develop it, and quietly but gently stop all the other things that we aren't doing, and stop people going away and going, I have this great idea, I'm going to do it. Yeah, but before you do, have you actually spoken to FE, or Enterprise NI, or Invest? Because you might find that they're actually doing it already. More and better innovation-driven enterprises, as I said earlier, this to me is very important because this is how the entrepreneurship strategy is going to deliver the innovation work stream because this is the disruptors and innovators. These are the companies, whether it's on digital side, on deep tech, spin outs from um, universities, etc., who are looking at things in a different way, who are coming up with a different solution to a problem that we all look at. And the work we're currently doing is with the um, MIT in Boston, they have a program called the Regional Entrepreneurship Accelerator Program, and we're involved in that as an international program. And out of that, we've, we've come up with three things. So a backbone organization, so something that is dedicated to supporting people who have an innovation, an innovative, technological, different way of looking at something, and how do we actually support them to develop that idea? Proof of concept. So, okay, if it's something to do with that you want to test this, you know, minimal viable product, product development, you need somebody to go away and help you with that. And then business accelerator. So nothing new or extraordinary, but these are all dedicated to helping support IDEs, which we haven't had before. So you get a bit of support from Invest, you get a bit of support from Intertrade, you get a bit of support from a Techstart or whoever it is, but it's not all brought together under one roof. And that's what we're trying to do in terms of that. Entrepreneurship, cultural ambition. I thought this was really quite interesting. When you go into the research, there's this international monitor called Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. And it's a survey that's undertaken across about 100 plus countries. And when you look at Northern Ireland, I suppose we get a double whammy. 
in terms of our entrepreneurial activity, and this is, this is what I would describe as sort of the inspiration. So it goes out to people to say, would you be interested in being an entrepreneur? And then also, what obstacles do you perceive? And there's a whole range of other questions, but on those two sort of key metrics, across the UK, we're the lowest for would you be interested in being an entrepreneur? And we have the highest in terms of the, the challenges that you perceive to being an entrepreneur. And I think one of the things that we're looking at is, the other metric there is the, the rate of births and deaths in Northern Ireland against the rest of the UK. But our aim is to embed innovation and entrepreneurship across the education sector. So it's to stop the old, oh right, you know, if, if, you're, if you're academically gifted, you'll be a doctor, an accountant, a lawyer, I'm sorry, I'm an accountant, and you'll do all of that. Well, yes, but actually I have a really good idea and I'd just like to go away and have a go at that. Absolutely not, we'll beat that idea, you're going to university. Or you're going to FE, or you're going to do whatever you're doing. And that is our culture. And what we want to do is look at how do we start that in primary and post-primary schools? How do we bring it through to FE colleges? How do we bring it to universities? And don't worry, I'm not saying that this isn't happening, but we need to do it a lot more. Because that is a hell of a challenge for us. Because to me, as part of the strategy is, how do you get the pipeline of people coming through? There's no point just looking at people today. That's why we need to start with the schools. We've got cohorts in FE. We've got cohorts in the university. In terms of the next slide, there's three sort of, oh, excuse me, three key points there. Access to finance. So whether you're a small business, medium-sized business, you, you have aspirations to, you know, go on to the, the international markets and get, you, you know, uh, equity funding and etc. Everybody needs access to finance. So British Business Bank, hopefully you'll have seen, just recently has launched. They're doing a 70 million fund over five years, and we are very closely involved, myself and colleagues in Invest to work with them in terms of how they're doing that. But also Invest in I is also reviewing what its current debt and equity support is. And one of the big challenges they have is me coming to them and saying, yes, that's fine, but by the way, we need to have to look in terms of diverse founders, female entrepreneurs, non-university graduates, black and ethnic minority people, disabilities and socially deprived. And that makes it very difficult because fund managers are all about profit and about making you know, returns. And we're saying, yeah, but we want you to go and actively search and, and market this to people and have more of these people coming forward with applications. And that's going to be difficult. Sorry. Okay. Next one is develop home market advantage. And I think that's actually really important. There's, a, there's an enormous amount of buying power between central government, local government, all the public bodies. And is it actually well aligned to supporting an SME or is it very difficult for an SME to come and try and procure and be part of a procurement process? We have social value contracts, but there's other challenges there too. And as this is one where I'd put my hand up and say there's a lot of work, both central and local, to make it more accessible for a small business to get support from their local government. And I'm not saying a grant, I'm saying I have a product, I want you to buy it. It's a really good product, but you see your system and your process, it's a pain in the ass for me to try and apply. And I'm really busy and I don't have the time to do it. Those are real life challenges and we need to address those. And whether that's local government and central government. And the last one then is the lever support for uh, innovation driven enterprise for corporates. We have a lot of big businesses in Northern Ireland who have access to customers, they've access to R&D, they've access to, you know, uh, like research facilities, et cetera, et cetera, that when you're looking at it from somebody who's trying to test a product to go and talk to a customer who can actually say, look, that's a really good idea, but it's not going to work because here's why, or you need to develop this aspect, or you need to do something different. So one of the things we're saying to them is under corporate social responsibility, how do we encourage you to support startups and IDEs in Northern Ireland? How, how do we try and make this a self-fulfilling prophecy here? And as I say, examples of that can be access to customers, technical support, mentoring. Now that's hard too because they're driven by the bottom line. Once upon a time I used to work for a PLC, we had to report every month, every quarter, sales every week. It's a very driven environment. So they're going, what's in it for us? Well, 
it's a good and a bad. Okay, like all R&D and investments, you could involve in three projects and two of them are rubbish, but one of them could be the next gold star. And that person will be forever indebted and will m more than likely want to work with you in the future. But if you don't try, you'll never win. And finally, you'll be glad to know, alignment with investment area 2.1. And I think actually, gently, there's a huge amount of read across here, which is great. So to me, and I've just put out, you know, to operate at scale through cross-border collaboration, absolutely. Engage in commercially-led innovation, that's exactly what 10X is all about. It's all about an innovation-driven economy. Effectively transition to engage in low-carbon circular economy, sustainability. Um, Keith, I don't know if he said to you that he was the architect behind the circular economy strategy that's currently out there at the moment. Key part of what we're trying to do and support SMEs to deliver productivity improvements and transition. And please be clear, this is not about, oh, SMEs are being left on the shelf, quite the reverse. We absolutely understand SMEs are the lifeblood of this economy. What we're also trying to do is identify those innovation-driven enterprises that are a bit different and put you in a slightly different lane that has more bespoke support. Because you are the people who could drive changes, whether it's in low carbon, digitization, software, you name it. But we have them. But what we can't afford is have them sort of languishing in, here's a business case. I've got a business case. What I need to do is talk to people in the universities about setting a research lab up here, or I need to talk to somebody in a venture capital because I'm going to be spending two million pounds over the next two years, and I need funding right now. And these people, if they don't get it here, and it's a great idea, they'll go to Dublin, they'll go to London, they'll go to the States and they'll get it. But why can't we have them here? You'll be delighted. That's me to shut up. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Trevor. Uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Fiona Rooney from uh, Pinnacle Growth Group. Uh, Fiona has been appointed to assist the SUPB with the uh, concept note process and she's going to give you a little bit more detail about the 2.1 investment area and then talk you through the concept note and how to complete it. Over to Fiona. Good afternoon everybody um, and to the new people in the room as well. So yes, my name is Fiona Rooney. I am from an organisation called Pinnacle Growth Group and we're delighted to support SEUPB with the pre-development support um, process under the Peace Plus programme, um, Investment Area 2.1, which is SME um, development and trans, um, transition. So as you've maybe heard throughout um, this afternoon already, this um, investment area is to enhance growth and competitiveness of SMEs and increased job creation. So that is the main specific objective of 2.1. Um, this will aim to result in the development of a stronger, more innovative and collaborative program area, SME base, delivering high levels of um, productivity, exports and sustainable employment. So folks, just um, as a reminder as well, all of this information will be on the SEUPB website. The presentations will be on there as well, along with the concept note. So just in case you are worried about missing anything, you can download that um, and work on that. So the concept note is already on there and the website will, or the, sorry, the presentations will follow in due course as well. So today um, we're here to give you an overview of Investment Area 2.1 and then provide support in developing your concept note as well. So some people may have already started that process. Alternatively, you can have a discussion with us in advance of completing your concept note and then what will happen after that is we'll assess that and identify any further support that you may need going forward with that as well. We aim to provide you with feedback within 15 days of submission of your concept note as well. And the deadline date for that is the 4th of May as well. But that will um, we'll remind you of those dates as we go forward as well. So, the, sorry, so what do we aim to achieve under 2.1? So the investment area will build upon existing investment to support SMEs to operate at scale through cross-border collaboration. It will engage in commercial-led um, innovation effective transition to engage in the low carbon circular economy 
deliver productivity improvements or transition to the latest digital tools as well and strengthen the programme area. So we aim to do that and how do we aim to do that? By promoting innovation and collaboration to increase productivity and the ability to export and employ high skilled individuals as well. So who are we looking to get involved? It is suitable for cross-border partnerships with the capacity to deliver on all of the outputs, the result indicators and the actions required. So I will provide further details on the outputs and the result indicators. So bearing in mind, um, do take them into um, large consideration when you're putting together your concept note. Um, this investment area is expecting around one, possibly two applications to be successful. So it is really important to consider those outputs and result indicators and build those into your project. Um, in addition to that, we are looking for a project that will be in and around four years. Um, and again, take into consideration starting the project, the implementation stage, and then finalising the project at the end as well for that. So take that into consideration when you're building up your project as well. And it's a, we're looking for a partnership able to develop solutions which will deliver high levels of productivity, exports, and sustainable employment in the programme area as well. So as I mentioned, there's only one, potentially two projects that could come out of this. So we are looking for a project that will impact the entire programme area as well. So for this investment fund, there is 25 million available. Um, 25 million euros are available and it can be up to 100% um, eligible cost as well and can be sought through it. And as mentioned, one, potentially two projects. So the scope, we're looking for projects um, that will meet any, um, as many of this in the scope as possible. As I mentioned, there is only going to be one to two, so you're looking to achieve um, as many of these actions as possible, if not them all. So we're looking to su support SMEs, um, capacity assessment and mentoring programs to increase capacity in the target areas, including sustainability, development pr practices, new product and process development, digitalization and post-COVID-19 recovery and adoption planning. We're also looking at cross-border collaboration, research and innovative products, or sorry, projects for products or processes, creation and management of innovation-focused collaboration and clusters, cross-border academic and industrial collaborative projects as well, and then the creation and management of support for scaling networks in key growth areas. So that would be the main sort of scope of 2.1 and it is really important to take those into consideration when you're developing up your project um, delivery and what you aim to achieve. So how is this measured and what's considered? So projects are really encouraged to encompass all of those actions that I've just mentioned and demonstrate that in a regional based partnership, ensuring the deliveries across the entire programme area as I'd previously mentioned there as well. Um, you also need to ensure that you consider all of the outputs and result indicators that I'll also provide. And it also envisages that the proposals will look at te technological um, improvements on a cross-border basis and address local issues of strategic importance to the region. So as Trevor um, and Dave previously mentioned, there's a lot of objectives and um, targets that each of the departments are looking to achieve as well. Do take those into consideration as well when you're developing up your project. And um, one of the most important areas as well, obviously, Peace Plus objective. You need to take that into consideration because it's also going to be measured. How will your project contribute to a more peaceful, prosperous and stable society in Northern Ireland and the border counties of Ireland as well? So the outputs and the result indicators. So as I mentioned, you will need to try and achieve all of these and work towards achieving these. So there are 37 enterprises supported by grants. Your projects targets will contribute towards that indicator. Two projects for innovation networks across borders. 1,907 enterprises supported and then 1,878 non-financial support. So the likes of the non-financial support, it will be important to make sure that you keep good records for that as well um, so that you can prove that that's, that's been achieved. 
And then the result indicator for each of those is 1,430 SMEs introducing um, product or process innovations. So as I've mentioned, it is really important that you demonstrate that your project proposal will um, deliver a significant proportion of those outputs and result indicators within this objective. Um, so again, think about your project, what can you achieve, how many beneficiaries are going to um, achieve getting involved in your project as well. So the SME Development and Transition um, Initiatives so this is a summary of them and there is a bit more detail in the concept notes as well. Um, but here we're looking at initiatives designed to deliver cross-community and cross-border collaborative approaches to contribute to the development of a stronger, more innovative and collaborative program area SME base. Develop and implement um, implementation of support that facilitates SMEs in delivering higher levels of productivity exports and sustainable employment, build upon existing collaborative cross-border relationships and service provision, and supporting SMEs in creating innovative networks and clusters. So that is a summary of them, but as I mentioned, there is a bit more detail in the concept notes as well. So the concept note then. So the concept note is a short document. It consists of three pages and about four pages of guidance notes. It is a wee bit more guidance notes than maybe some of the other investment areas, if anybody's familiar with them. And the reason for that is there's a slightly new element that can be considered under 2.1, which is open project. So there is one question for that, and it's not a mandatory question to answer, but I'll provide you with more detail as that, as on that as we go forward. So that's why it's a wee bit longer. The concept note um, contains two sections. At the beginning, there will be the questions um, that you can fill in, and the second part is guidance notes on those as well. It is available already, as previously mentioned. It is not scored, um, so you don't need to worry about it being assessed or anything. It's an opportunity for you to develop up the foundations of a future application and for us to provide you with feedback up on that and how it aligns with the programme. So each question is between three to 500 words. Do try and stick within. That word count would be fantastic. There's no word count and there is no character count or anything like that, but it is just really beneficial for yourself and for us um, to provide you with feedback if you can stick within sort of that word count as well. That would be really helpful. And as I've mentioned, um, the closing, they are open now and available from now and they close on the 4th of May. So I'll just um, provide you with a bit more um, breakdown in those. But... It is really important that everybody sort of engages. As I've mentioned, there is only one, possibly two projects from this. So at the end of the day, do feel free to engage with each other um, in the foyer there as well, develop up partnerships, discuss projects that you're thinking of, and it does give an opportunity to um, build up further ideas. Do feel free to come and talk to myself as well at the end, and um, my email address will be up there as well so you can reach out. Um, but it will give you the opportunity to provide um, further feedback in your, your application um, as you go forward. So the concept note then, um, as I mentioned, it's not a formal application and it's not scored, but it does give the opportunity for us to provide you with further support as you, you go forward. The concept note is based on a future application. It's not all the same questions, it's not the exact same questions that's going to be on the application or anything, but it will provide you with a foundation for when it gets to application stage. So the concept note, so over the next few slides, I'll provide you with an overview of the concept note and the areas it's going to um, focus upon. Um, and as I mentioned, it is just really building on the foundations of an application that you, you would like to take forward. So question one then really. So question one is all about your project. How has the need been identified and how does your project align with Peace Plus? So as I mentioned earlier, it is really important. Automatically, everybody sees this is about SME development, um, but we need to remember the focus here is about the Peace Plus program and its objective. So it's about peace and reconciliation, and it's about peace and um, prosperity as well. So don't forget to include that in your proposal. It is extremely important. The next stage that I would say then you need to consider is the objective, so 2.1 objective the key outputs and the result indicators as well. So you need to say, this is what your project is and how it helps achieve each of those. 
And then also taking into consideration what the department stated today as well and their strategies and their aims and objectives. Again, it needs to be built into your project and how the need has been developed up as well and how it aligns with um, their strategies also. So a few things to note as well. So it's contributing to the development of a stronger, more innovative and collaborative program. Um, SME base. Now, I'll have said that a few times, so it's just to show you how important that really is. So do uh, make sure that you consider that when developing it. Deliver higher levels of productivity, exports and sustainable employment, and build upon existing collaborative cross-border relationships and service provisions. So the next one is bringing it back to the outputs and result indicators that I've already highlighted. So this is a specific question around that and how um, you're going to help achieve those. So it, the Peace Plus program is a result oriented program. So in this section, you can tell us how you're going to contribute it, contribute it to those and significant, significantly um, achieve those as well. Um, as I'd mentioned, 37 enterprises um, will receive supportive grant, two projects for innovation network across border, 1,700 and sorry, 1,907 enterprises supported, of which are micro, small and medium, and then 1,879 enterprises with non-financial support. So the, it's worth noting as well, an enterprise is counted once, regardless how many times of support they receive. So you can receive um, grant support and non-financial support, and you will be counted one against the same objective. So it, is, so it is worth noting that, that there's no real double counting as well. So do take that to, into consideration when you're developing up your project. So the cross-border and cross-community element of it as well, um, we do need to make sure that it, because there's only going to be one, possibly two projects within the scheme, you do need to show that it's going to be across the entire programme area. And projects are encouraged to then obviously encompass all the actions that I've previously mentioned, in addition to the result outputs and indicators, ensuring across um, the in entire programme area and have the competence to engage with all the target growth sectors and deliver a significant, um, a a significant proportion of the outputs as well. So uh, you do need to consider what services are going to be delivered, how are, they, how are you going to ensure that there's a meaningful participation from all of the program areas as well? How will you achieve that? Have you considered other um, synergies with other provisions and other programs that are out there as well, including a lot of the lists that Trevor had mentioned earlier as well? So has that been considered and where are they being delivered? And then the engagement and collaboration you have um, conducted to demonstrate the co-design with SMEs and real life practical needs um, as well. So again, taking those into consideration for the cross-border element. Linking into that, the displacement and duplication, as Trevor had mentioned, there are a lot of provisions out there and support mechanisms out there for SMEs. Um, so it's about making sure that there's no duplication with those or displacement with those. So have you considered those? How will your project complement those? Is your project likely to impact those? Um, and how can you avoid it and mitigate them? as well. So again, that's the perfect opportunity to network with others. And on the 2.1 um, SAUPB website page, there is an opportunity to put in your name and your details if you'd like to share and network with others to share project ideas or maybe collaborate on project ideas as well. So the next question then, your team partnership and implementation programs. Um, arrangements. So this will slightly link in with the open project that I'm going to inform you about in um, question seven. So just bear it in mind for these um, linking to this question. But under question five, we want to know about how the project is going to be managed, how is it going to be implemented, how is it going to be designed. So the concept note will ask for a high level um, detail of that, including the budget. We'll, ex um, we'll assess the extent to which it is coherent and proportionate, so the amount you're asking for against the outputs and the targets and the actions that you're going to achieve as well, and the team, who's going to deliver it, what experience do they have, what qualifications, have you identified any gaps, how are you going to address those gaps as well, are you considering proposing to use an open project, which I'll advise you about in a little bit, describe the partnership, 
you know, sometimes you forget to, some people might forget to say how you've come up with the partnership, how have you come up with that partner? Is it a shared model that you've done before? Have you done project delivery with them before? Was it successful? Um, or have you identified a new partner? Um, and how will that work out? Are there any agreements in place? Any structures in place? Um, and, and provide us with a bit of detail in that. Give it um, good thought as well about around the financial administration responsibilities of the project. So the lead partner will be responsible for that, for example. Have you thought about that? Are our par all partners aware of that? And how will that run? And are you financially secure and have sufficient cash flows um, in place to reimburse expenditure in arrears as well? So again, think about the cash flows and how that will implicate, implicate things. And how you'll deliver the outcomes and impacts after the project ends. So think about your exit strategy there as well. So it is a lot of detail there, but um, do try and stick to sort of high level details of, of your thoughts behind that. So question six, value for money. So this is the bit um, where we're thinking more about, you know, what's your budget? Um, what are you going to, what, what budget are you needing? Um, the time associated with that as well and the financial allocation of the budget lines against the work packages that you're thinking of developing. Um, it's really important under actually when it gets to assessment that the value for money um, is highly um, considered um, whenever it will be assessed. So it is really important to provide a good bit of detail on how you're going to achieve value for money under the Peace um, Plus program. So for example, if you're thinking of bringing in salary costs for that, are they suitable? Are they justified? Is it been tested against the market, for example? How many staff do you need? And what will the rules be? Is that attributable and proportionate to the project that you're going to deliver? If there's procurement, how will you carry out procurement? Will you test the market, etc. as well? So all of that will be considered along with your exit strategy again and thinking about the evidence of durability of your outcomes and impacts of the project. So the... Um, new element under 2.1, so this isn't really available under a lot of the other investment areas, it's specific for today's anyway, um, 2.1. So it's an open project um, idea that uh, SEUPB hasn't went with before, but have heard that it is, it's very beneficial to a lot of applicants and have taken it in, on board and considered it. It is worth noting that it's not fully finalised, um, but this is the sort of the basis of it. SEUPB will consider other elements as well, but they've yet to be finalised. So as Paul has mentioned, it, it is a still a bit of ongoing and there's certain documentation and regulations that maybe need finalised. So it's just to, to let you know about that. So the open project. So the open project characteristics are basically, as lead partner, you don't need to know who all your partners are at the very, be very beginning. So at preparation stage, you don't need to identify all of your partners involved. So, it is. so this gives you a bit more flexibility and enables a quicker start to your project. So it does. The lead partner and project partners submit an application. So it will be the responsibility of the lead, though, to submit the application. But the lead and the, and the project partners will develop the application and oversee the entire project management. The core partnership then pass on the program rules to sub-partners. The key partners... Um, so the core partner at the beginning, they develop a budgetary framework which um, they put in pl um, like placeholders. So that's for future um, partners that are going to get involved. So it's like a placeholder and it's identifying we're going to have these people being involved in advance. We just don't know who they are right now. So they can be decided at application stage. The partners agree in the eligibility type. So at the very beginning, you still do identify here's what our eligibility is going to be, here's what our work packages are, and here's what we're still aiming to deliver. Again, we just don't know who our partners are. So that will be identified at the start, along with the budgetary of what each of those will look like as well. So at a later stage, stage, the core partner then select the sub-partners, which become joined in in the programme at a later stage and become fully involved in the project as one of the beneficiaries. But one of the major advantages are that the key partnership ensures that most of the administration load linked to the application room reporting is removed from the shoulders of the sub-partners. So for example, you know, if it is an SME that comes on involved and they don't want all the administrative burden or having to get experience of it, for example, they can come on board and they don't have that on their shoulders to bear. So it would be the lead partner. So 
One of the elements is its approval of the project is conditional. So if the application is approved, it is a conditional um, offer on, because you've, you've identified your work packages and how the budget's still going to be spent. So it is a conditional offer. Assistance can be made available during the call opening and closing to assist you with the development of this model. So as was mentioned, it is a new concept to SAUPB in the program. It is still going to be slightly developed, but these are the main characteristics of it. The use of this mechanism should be limited to situations where it will add value. It's not to try and avoid things like procurement, for example. It is to add value to the delivery of your project and get you better outcomes from implementing this um, model as well. The core partnership must have enough capacity and experience in EU-funded projects to deliver the project and support it to sub-partners. Um, and again, like this morning, um, I will provide a bit more detail on what's expected expected from the lead partner and one of those is you need to have the experience and be able to support those sub partners um, who aren't familiar with delivering projects of this size or scale. Sub partners must contribute to the project aims, delivery and achievement of the performance framework outputs and results of the project. So at the beginning the core partner will have identified the um, results and the outputs and the indicators so the sub-partners will still be expected to contribute towards those. And then lead partners and um, partners and sub-partners must use and record the information on the GEM system. So while the lead partner will be responsible to SAUPB for, for providing reporting and doing claims and things like that, each of the partners and sub-partners will still need to record information on the GEM um, system as well. So the... Just to be a bit more. So the only sub-partners that are eligible are micro and small and medium enterprises in line with the outputs. So that's who your sub-partners would be. So they're the ones identified after the application has been submitted. As a sub-partner, it can be advantageous not to have to cooperate with the start of the entire process. So it is much easier to get the, you know, to identify that at the beginning because um, sometimes you don't know exactly who you need in there to help develop that up. Sub-partners can count towards the achievement of your outputs. So even though they're going to be a sub-partner, they can contribute towards and help count towards your result indicators and outputs there as well. And as I mentioned at the beginning, other models will be considered, but they will be closer to the opening call if, if other elements are considered in there. This is sort of just a diagram to sort of show, hopefully, um, I thought diagram might be a wee bit easier to show everybody. Um, so the beginning um, at, the, at the very left hand side there, you have got the core partnership. So that's at the very beginning. At this stage, the core partner submits the application. So they submit the application providing the budgetary framework. They identify the placeholders for the sub partners and details of the preliminary work plan and actions. So that's at the very beginning. Ne the next stage is the application is approved. Following application approval, the core partner approves the sub-partners. So they approve the sub-partners and the sub-partners come on board. The sub-partners then have the spec specification of the project developed, including their budget allocation. So each of the sub-partners then get their budget allocation so they know how much they have to spend. And then each of their work packages that are allocated to them also. And then that forms, at the very end, there, the full partnership. So the full partnership then deliver the entire open project um, activities and work packages. So again, that's where I mentioned earlier, everybody comes together and helps achieve the outputs and result indicators and the actions as well of your project. So just two things to remember really that it can't be used for, as I mentioned, it's to add value, it's not to sort of make things slightly easier. So it is a flexible approach, so it is, but it must not be used um, for supporting sub-projects or micro-projects. It's to um, be part of the entire project, the overall um, project. Um, replace or avoid procurement, as I mentioned, it shouldn't be used um, instead of that. Um, so I mentioned this isn't a uh, question that you must fill in. It's just if you'd like to consider the open um, project model, it provides us with a bit of feedback on what way you're thinking of adapting that and we can provide you with further detail on that in case it does slightly tweak. So, when, so in here, we're kind of looking at what would the key objectives of your sub partners um, be? What would their work packages be? What would their activities be? 
how can they contribute to it and the performance of the framework that you're intending to develop as well and how will they contribute to the entire project as, as a whole it's not about individual sub projects it has to be to the entire project that you've um, developed and what is the planned overall volume of the project and you just really need to justify um, the reasons for implementing that as well so that's the open project model for this investment call in relation to the lead partner um, so we will be expecting a lead partner to take the project on and it generally um, i do recognize a good few faces in the room and a lot of people maybe have undertaken that role before so it is for anybody else that's considering it, it is really important to consider the entire sort of responsibility of the lead partner. The lead partner um, will have to look after sort of the governance and the project of this size and scale. So as I mentioned, it's 25 million euro, um, potentially one to two projects. So do take that into consideration if you're going to be the lead partner and managing that kind of cash flow and that project size. You would also be responsible for the coordination of the project. So that's submitting the application assuming responsibility of the implementation of the entire project and coordinate with all of the projects and sub um, partners in that as well. So that would be your responsibility. Uh, the financial management as lead as well. So you would be responsible for the budget um, and the budget control of that. The eligibility and submission of claims and keeping all um, reports and documents for audit purposes, for example, as well, ensuring that those are all in place sufficient cash flow and funding allocations to partners so if you do bring a partner on and you're providing them with money back from their element of it that you are you're going to be responsible for that and any associated risks with that and not appropriate documentation sort of maintained for your claims reporting coordinating the reporting and overseeing the monitoring and evaluation and ensuring that they're done in a timely manner communication you make sure that you're communicating with all of the partners and the sub partners also keeping good communication with SEUPB, letting them know where the project's going and providing reports and feedback to um, your contract and your award. And then training as well. Sub partners and some partners may need additional training and information that's provided by SEUPB to the lead partner. So as lead partner, you'll be responsible for ensuring that they're fully trained and um, have all of that detail, along with any policies and procedures any agreements that you maybe need in place if you're going to bring somebody on board and provide financial assistance towards that for example so the lead partner in a nutshell is responsible for it all so do take that into consideration especially for the level of project you're going to propose as well so the time scales then going forward so take oh, there we go. so Take this opportunity, so it's about six weeks approximately to build up your concept note. So take this time, build partnerships, chat with everybody at the end of the day. Do use the SEUPB website um, 2.1 uh, holding page and you can go in there and put your details on it if you're looking for a partnership as well. You can have a chat with myself before you put your concept note in or afterwards as well and we'll follow up with meetings also. Speak to other potential applicants and try and see, you know, is there something that they're doing that you could maybe collaborate on and learn from each other, learn best practice from each other and develop on previous um, projects there. Be realistic. So obviously, as I'd mentioned, you do have to significantly um, contribute towards the outputs and the result indicators and the actions. So you will be monitored against those. So be realistic on what you're saying you're going to achieve. Um, don't bite off more than you can chew because at it, it, a later stage you will need to provide sort of um, support towards that as well and for your grants and claims as well. So just make sure it's something that you can achieve. Think about the finances I'd mentioned earlier. Do you have the cash flows um, that can, the cash flows and even the resources as well that you can look after a project of this size and have clarity on your project as well. Is it something that you can achieve? Is it a project that's going to achieve SEUPB objectives? 2.1 objectives and also building peace and good relations as well as part of your project. So the pre-development support is now available. It is on the website. Uh, you can go on and look at the concept note, download it now and start work on that. We will start engaging with people once they're submitted or if they prefer that in advance, have meetings with people. And once your concept note is submitted, we'll identify future support that you may need to help build up a strong application. The closing date is the 4th of May, 
and we do aim to provide feedback within, four, within 15 days of the submission of your concept note as well. So that's more or less it, I think. So thank you all very much.